do it. So far, we have completed the chapter Heredity and Evolution and have covered all the concepts that are included in this chapter in your textbook. So now, let us have a quick recap of all that we have learned. Students, in the introductory session, we have learned about various terms like genes, heredity, genetic information, variation, evolution, genotype and phenotype. Then from the example of a single bacterium reproducing asexually, we have learned how variations get accumulated in the subsequent generations and how this accumulation of variation is essential for evolution. Then we have learned about Gregor Johann Mendel who is considered as the father of genetics for his contribution towards the field of genetics. We have learned about Mendel's experiment on garden peas. In this chapter, we have learned about monohybrid and dihybrid inheritance. In monohybrid inheritance, which involves the inheritance of a single pair of contrasting characteristic, we have learned that in the first filial generation, only the dominant traits are expressed. Whereas in the second filial generation, both the dominant and the recessive traits gets expressed in the ratio of 3 to 1. In the example that we have considered, we have seen that the ratio of tall is to short plants in the second filial generation was 3 to 1. This is the monohybrid phenotypic ratio. And in dihybrid inheritance, which involves the inheritance of two pairs of contrasting characteristic at the same time. We have learned that in the first filial generation, both the parental traits combine and only the dominant trait shows up. Whereas in the second filial generation, in addition to the original parental characteristic, some new combinations are also seen. For example, in the example that we have considered, we have seen that the original parental traits were round and yellow colored seeds and wrinkled and green colored seeds. We have seen that in the first filial generation, all the seeds were round and yellow. Whereas in the second filial generation, some new combinations like round and green and wrinkled and yellow were also expressed. A total of four different combinations of traits were obtained in the ratio of 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. This is the dihybrid phenotypic ratio. After that, we have learned how the traits get expressed in the progeny. Then we learned that the sex is determined by various factors in different species. In case of human beings, the sex of the child depends on whether the paternal chromosome is an X chromosome, which will result in the formation of a girl child, or a Y chromosome, which will result in the formation of a boy child. Then we learned about inherited and acquired traits. And now we know that all the acquired traits are due to changes in the non-reproductive tissues. So they do not get passed on to the progeny. For example, all the skills that you learn throughout your lifetime. For example, the ability to sing, dance, swim, etc. are acquired traits. We also learned that the processes like genetic drift and natural selection causes variation in the organisms, which when combined with the isolation of population so that there is no gene exchange between them gives rise to the formation of a new species from the pre-existing ones. 
this process is called speciation. So we can say speciation may take place when variations are combined with geographic isolations. Then we learned how evolutionary relationships are traced in classification of organisms and how life originated on earth from simple inorganic molecules. We have studied about the theory of origin of life on earth proposed by JBS Heldon and also discussed about Miller and Urey's experiment that confirmed Heldon's theory. Then after learning evolution and classification, we discussed about some sources that provide evidence for evolution. The sources that we considered were homologous organs. Homologous organs provide evidence for evolution by suggesting that all the organisms have a common ancestor. Analogous organs. Analogous organs provide evidence for evolution by suggesting that even though organisms do not have a common ancestor, they can still evolve to behave in similar ways in order to sustain in the prevailing environmental conditions. The third source of evidence for evolution was fossils. For this, we considered the example of Archaeopteryx. We have seen that in the Archaeopteryx, both the reptilian and the avian traits were present. So, we could suggest that the Archaeopteryx is a connecting link between the reptiles and the birds. And birds must have evolved from reptiles. This way, fossils also provide evidence for evolution. Then we learned how evolution takes place by stages. And by taking the example of wild cabbage, we have seen how human beings, by means of artificial selection, have cultivated different breeds of food for their own convenience. Students, to analyze the hereditary molecular differences better, and to gain information on an organism's evolutionary relationship, we can take the help of molecular phylogeny. And while we are studying about evolution, it would be incomplete if we do not mention the very famous Charles Darwin. He is best known for his contribution towards the field of evolution. He proposed that all life forms have descended from a common ancestor. He also put forward the theory that suggests evolution is because of natural selection. One thing to note here is that students, we should not say that evolution is the progress from lower to higher life forms. Rather, evolution has resulted in the development of more complex body designs even when the simpler body designs still continue to flourish. And at last, while studying about evolution in human beings, we learned that all human beings are a single species that originated in Africa and spread across the world in stages. With this, we have concluded the chapter Heredity and Evolution. I hope all the concepts are very clear to you and that you secure very good marks in your exams. All the best. Mm -hmm.